Hi everybody. In this slide lecture, we're going to review some of the terminology that applies to flowers and floral structure. All flower parts of seed-bearing plants were originally derived from leaves, and over millions of years, flowers have evolved with their respective pollinators, and the result is the amazing variety of shape, color, and fragrance and smell, stink, that we see in the flowering plants today. Reproduction is the sole function for which flowers evolved. Some plants disseminate their pollen by wind and don't have any need for showy flowers that lure pollinators. The flowers of these plants tend to be fairly muted in color, pale tan or shades of brown. And while these flowers aren't showy from a human perspective, many of them still have an elegant, understated beauty and are definitely worthy of a place in our landscapes. For plants that are pollinated by members of the animal kingdom, their flowers are a lure. They have brightly colored petals, maybe fanciful shapes, fragrance or a stink, and all of these are signals to their respective pollinators that say, hey, come on in. So today we're going to be looking at the typical flower structure of a perfect flower in order to learn some of the basic terminology that's going to help us describe flowers and help us identify plants. Let's start with perfect flowers. A perfect flower is also referred to as being bisexual or hermaphrodite. And a perfect flower is one which contains both male and female reproductive parts. In the photos on the right here, you can see four examples of perfect flowers. You've got the jade plant, Crassula ovata, the friendship sage, the San Gabriel flannel bush, and beech strawberry. And I know these photos are rather small, but if you look really carefully, you can see both the male and female reproductive structures in these photos. Imperfect or unisexual refers to a flower that has only male or only female parts. If we have separate male and female flowers on the same plant, the plant is referred to as being monoecious. And this is derived from two Greek words meaning one or single, mono, and house, oecious. So we have separate male and female flowers in a single house. And a good example is the one here on the right, which is our California native shrub, Corylus cornuta, the California hazelnut. And here we've got the, the male flowers and here is the female flower. If we have separate male and separate female flowers on separate plants, then the plant is referred to as being dioecious, so two houses. And examples of this would be leucodendron, the cone bush, the South African shrub, Garia elliptica, which is pictured here on the right, another California native shrub, and all of the genera in the southern hemisphere family of rushes, the restios, or restionaceae. Here we've got a, a picture of one of the most common restios that you'll see in coastal California landscapes, Elegia elephantina used to be called Chondropetalum elephantinum, and you'll still see it marketed under that name in some nurseries. And here's another example of a plant that's dioecious, the kiwi fruit, Actinidia deliciosa. This has separate male and female plants, and the photo here is of a really nice specimen of kiwi fruit trained on a wire system as an informal espalier at the Royal Horticultural Society 
garden in Harrogate in England. So a little more terminology. Regular, radially symmetrical and actinomorphic are all interchangeable terms that describe flowers that can be cut into equal halves along more than one vertical plane. And examples would be Osteospermum, the African daisy, um, Cystanthe, Grandiflora, the rock purslane, still sold under the old name often of Calandrinia grandiflora, the Crassula ovata jade plant that was in one of those four photos at the beginning of this presentation, and the rock roses, Cystis. And zygomorphic, bilaterally symmetrical or irregular are terms that we use to describe flowers that have bilateral symmetry. So we can only draw a line in one direction and obtain two equal halves. So for example, on this uh, sticky monkey bush on the right there, if we draw a vertical line like that, we can obtain two mirror halves on that flower. So that's zygomorphic, bilateral, or irregular. Other plants that you might be familiar with that are bilaterally, bilaterally symmetrical are all plants, plants in the mint family, all plants in the pea family, and all penstemons as well. So where do we start when we're going to be looking at a flower? It's really good to start with a flower that's really large and perfect and simple so that you can see all of the parts really, really easily. And good examples to start with include tulips when they're in season and Easter lilies. The lilies you can obtain almost year round from the local forest. And what you're going to do is start at the bottom of the flower and work your way up. And you're starting at the outside and working your way in. Flower parts are arranged in concentric rings or whorls. And a complete flower has four concentric whorls, the calyx, the corolla, the stamens, and the pistil. Flowers lacking one or more of these four whorls are termed incomplete. And remember that monoecious and dioecious plants will have incomplete flowers always because they only have either male or female flowers. And just to confuse things, some plants are polygamous. They have both unisexual and bisexual flowers. Most flowers are attached to a plant by a stalk and the stalk of an individual flower or inflorescence is called a peduncle and in everyday language we just call it the flower stem. If there is no stalk the flower is termed sessile or sessile. That's the same term that we use for leaves that have no petiole. And the area at the top of the stalk here is the receptacle. And at the tip of the, the flower stalk or the pedicel, there's an apical meristem where cells are rapidly dividing and forming all of the floral structures and arranging them into whorls. As we continue to work our way upwards through the flower from the receptacle, we come to the sepals and the petals. The sepals are usually, but not always, green and often fairly small. Before the flower opens, the sepals enclose the flower bud and protect it. Collectively, the whorl of sepals is referred to as the calyx. And the calyx can be made up of completely separate sepals or the sepals may be fused together to form a, a tube. 
If the sepals are fused, their tips are usually free and they're referred to as calyx lobes. On the left here, we've got a picture of the underside of a purple potato bush, Lysianthes rantanetii, showing five fused sepals. So there's one, two, three, four, and then another one hidden behind the stem there. And you can see five fused petals. On the right, we've got Lepicania fragrans, Pitcher Sage, another California native shrub, and here you can see really nicely the calyx fused into a tube and got five free lobes at the tips here and there are some hidden behind the uh, back of the flower there continuing our journey upwards we come to the petals and collectively, the whorl of petals is referred to as the corolla. The corolla can consist of separate or fused petals. And if they're fused, the free tips are referred to as corolla lobes. Sometimes the sepals and petals are really, really similar and we can't tell the difference between the two. And in this case, we have an out and we can just refer to them collectively as tepals. And a good example of this would be tulips. Collectively, the calyx and corolla together form the perianth. And at some point after pollination, the perianth dies and falls away to expose the developing fruit. And this is a good point to remind you that it can be really easy to confuse petals with colorful bracts, as in um, bougainvillea or leucodendron and uh, Spanish lavender as well. Bracts are leaf-like structures that are associated with flowers. Here's a picture of um, a tulip showing um, what tepals are. Here you can't see any sepals at the top of the stem. The petals and sepals look identical, so a good example of tepals. And other examples would be magnolia and lilies. Here's a photo of a Magnolia sulangiana on the Cabrillo campus showing that there's no obvious difference there between the, the sepals and the petals. Let's look at the male reproductive organs, the stamens. Inside the whorls of sepals and petals, or tepals, are the reproductive organs. And the male parts are referred to as stamens, the singular stamen. And one of the ways, the silly ways to remember um, that the stamens are the, the male reproductive parts is just to think stay men. So each stamen consists of a stalk called the filament. And each filament is tipped with an anther. And sometimes the anther looks like two miniature hot dogs sort of laid side by side, or rather not hot dogs, but two hot, hot dog buns. Each anther holds grains of pollen and each pollen grain contains two male sex cells called sperm. The base of the filament is attached to the receptacle or sometimes to a petal. Usually anthers and pollen are yellow, but other colors such as red, white, blue, orange and purple are sometimes seen. Sometimes the anthers may be absent and there's only a filament. 
This means that the stamen is sterile and a sterile stamen is called a staminode. The number of stamens, the position of attachment and the color are usually the same between closely related species and usually very similar within a single plant family as well. The number of stamens, the position of attachment and their color are really important in the identification of plants. On the right, you can see a tulip that's been stripped of its tepals, showing six stamens and their point of attachment here on the receptacle. And then in the middle here is the female reproductive structure, which is a, a fused pistil. Right at the center of the flower, we find the female reproductive structure, referred to as a pistil. At the base of the pistil is the ovary, which is attached to the receptacle, and each chamber within the ovary is referred to as a locule. Inside the ovary, we've got ovules, and each ovule contains an egg that develops into a seed after successful fertilization. We've got a slender stalk called the style that extends upwards from the ovary, so here. And there may be one or more styles. And the style may be divided into two or more lobes. At the top of the style is the stigma, which receives the pollen from the male reproductive structures. And the stigma may be sticky or dry, and it may be shaped like a thread, a cup, or a ball, or forked, and is sometimes divided into multiple parts. And the, the way to remember that the stigma receives pollen from the male reproductive parts is that the pollen sticks to the stigma. Got a nice picture here of the perfect flower of Cystanthe grandiflora or Calendrinia grandiflora, rock purslane on the left, showing the petals, numerous stamens here, and the pistil right in the middle with the, here's the ovary, the style, and stigma right at the top there. On the right is the tulip again with the tepals and stamens stripped away this time, just showing the pistil remaining in the middle. Many flowers have nectaries, which are nectar producing glands. And usually the nectary is close to the ovary or underneath it. In some species though, the nectary is actually on the ovary or it may be on the style, on the petals, the sepals, the stems, or even the leaves. Nectar contains water and sugars and sometimes vitamins and oils and nectar is the reward for pollinators 